regulations is something that you don't even dare approach with a 10 foot pole using control studies. Kasi parang, parang hindi sila match. Right? And diplomatic historians in, 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 in the, the, the discipline of history itself, uh, diplomatic history, the sub-discipline of, of diplomatic history is very, in a way, very exclusive. And very few people study diplomatic history and uh, it's like a, an exclusive club. Like many old people are here. Okay, one of my teachers was a renowned diplomatic historian, and he was also the one well, he was the one who made me read this essay and he gave us a challenge. How do you use now the theory that you're learning in your cultural studies program to study foreign relations, especially American relations? Okay? Then we were reading some stuff. So I made a review. Okay? I studied uh, text on Philippine American relations. The first one was this is the considered the Bible for, for American foreign relations, of Philippine American foreign relations, the New Empire and Interpretation of American Expansion, 1868, uh, 1860 to 1878. Now that book influenced the other one, the next one, Ernest May's uh, American Imperialism Perspective Essay, and Theodora Gonzalo Saide. Uh, of course, the great father, Nella Costa and Father Arcelia, they all talk about Philippine American relations. But the perspective that they are using are kind of, how do you say that? It's, it's limited. Limited to what the paper mentioned earlier that America came here for economic reasons, uh, there was expansion, and there was group making here for religious reasons. But I wasn't convinced of what they are saying because back of my mind, I, try, I was trying to make connections. What was the dominant thought uh, in, um, in, the, in, in American society in the 19th century? Okay? And for me, the, uh, the dominant thought during that time could have influence how they relate with other people. Okay. Then I read Richard we Richard Wilde's response to imperialism. Okay, and that was followed by uh, Stuart Miller's benevolent assimilation. And this is where they talked about race. Okay, how race uh, played a major role in the American colonization of the Philippines. Then I read Christine Hoganson's fighting for American manhood how gender politics provoke the Spanish-American and, and Philippine-American wars, okay? Uh, talks about gender, Christine Robertson talk, uh, talked about how the frontier ended, the American frontier ended, and the need now for America to find a new playground for its wars, right? They needed to have a base somewhere far, so that the boys, their boys can play, right? Because they're afraid that too much civilization caused American men to suffer from neurasthenia. What's neurasthenia? Neurasthenia was a, tignan nyo ha, you listen to this. It's a disease, it's a malady, it's a, dis a disorder and the cause of the disorder is over-civilization. That's what happens. When men become over-civilized, they become effeminate. Right? And when they become effeminate, they may no longer have the virility to what? To continue on what is the great American civilization. So in other words, nagiging effeminate yung mga lalaki, so they have to find a new playground for them so that they can be in touch with their native instinct. Well, and of course, their masculinity. So nagkaroon sila ng mga naval bases. And of course, they cannot just put up bases anywhere. They have to find a place. 
and the Philippines then, Spain was collapsing as an empire. Then the collapse was hastened because of the Spanish-American War. I think you're familiar that how America got into the war was very controversial. And as a result of the war, of course, you have the Philippines is what well, is up for grabs, and the United States took the Philippines along with the other colonies. Um, then there are theories. Uh, theories. These are now theories on foreign relations, on media studies. Uh, well, visual images first. Peter Burke uh, said that visual images like paintings, statues, prints, and so on allow us, posterity, to share the nonverbal experiences and knowledge of past cultures. They bring home to us what we may, may have known but did not take so seriously before. Okay? Things of the past are left behind. Right? We see these things, but we don't really know what was the reason for the construction of something. Right? We don't know. Okay? But Peter Berg says that visual images can actually tell me what's going on before. And this is what I want. This, I, I got interested, so I said, why not I will try to look for pictures now or caricatures that reflect Philippine American relations. And these caricatures should be drawn by Americans, not Filipinos. Okay. Then Peter Burke continues by saying, although texts also offer valuable clues, images themselves are the best guide to the power of visual representations in the political life of past cultures. We have to then there's Hami Moana, okay? American media did not have a direct role in the formulation of foreign policy. They continue to have a growing influence in its implementation, explanation, and articulation. The media are consistently used by the government as a diplomatic forum to help set the tone pattern and agenda for political policy matters. Uh, I don't have to go into details on this, but you will notice this in the newspapers that we have, like the, 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 the daily news in uh, the newspaper, the newsprint, the in on TV. Right now, for instance, you know the 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 what the subject of many news reports now is 2010, right? And all the controversies that revolve around our leaders and what and those who are. What the presidential boss, and of course you see so many things. Mani, si Mani Villar ang nagbayad sa mga pamasahe. Then you, be, you, you hear that all the time, right? And Corina is for what? Uh, environment and Rojas is no longer Mr. Padente but Mr. Farmacia because he's for cheaper drugs and all those stuff, right? Okay. And 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 when you are of course, if you go to show this, it's Ding Dong and Marian and Friends Lang Kami, etc. That shapes our thinking, right? Okay. Then there's Peters, his book called White, White Negroes. He writes about how the black image was used to describe the inferiority of the Irish uh, in the mid 1800s. Publications like Punch in Britain and Harper's Weekly in the United States. Now, the Irish are, of course, white, right? But they were considered inferior. So they are not so white. And because they are not white, they are depicted as the white Negroes. They may, be, they may appear white, but the structure of the faces, they look closer to Africans than, than Irish. And of course, they look closer to monkeys than human beings. But we, uh, I will not go into those things. Then one of the first uh, diplomatic historians to consider ideology is Michael Hunt. So Michael Hunt, ang ginawa niya, he wrote a book called Ideology and Foreign, U.S. Foreign Relations. He talked about the role of ideology in shaping American relations. And he said that ideology is an interrelated set of convictions or assumptions that reduces the complexities of a particular